Okay, we're going to start, even though I'm sure people will come and many will watch this um, as well on Facebook. So thanks, guys, for coming out on a Thursday night. Um, and I'm really, really happy to invite um, and introduce Dr. Wendy Chung. Um, so she wears many hats and is really an extraordinary leader in our field. So she's a clinical and molecular geneticist and the Kennedy Family Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine. And she's also the Director of Clinical Research of Safari, which is the Autism Research Institute of the Simons Foundation. So she received her BA in Biochemistry and Economics from Cornell, her MD from Cornell Medical School, and then her PhD in Genetics at Rockefeller University. She leads the Simons Foundation Powering Research for Knowledge, which is SPARC, um, as well as the Simons VIP study, which is a study of genetic subtypes of autism. She also directs the clinical and translational autism research portfolio at the Simons Foundation, and they've really done an extraordinary job in, um, in many aspects of research in autism over the last decade. Um, she leads NIH-funded research programs in human genetics across a range of conditions, and she's also very involved with precision medicine um, at Columbia University. So Dr. Chung is not only sort of a leader, I think, in, you know, in, in uh, research kind of policy, she's also just an incredible investigator herself. She's authored more than 300 peer-reviewed papers and 50 reviews and chapters in medical texts. I don't know when she sleeps, but somehow all this happens. Um, she's um, been the recipient of many awards, the American Academy of Pediatrics Young Investigator Award, the Medical Achievement Award by, uh, from um, Benai Olam, and a Career Development Award from Doris Duke. She's also really well known for her teaching and mentoring, and she actually won the Columbia University's highest teaching award, which is the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching. Um, so, you know, Dr. Chung really enjoys the challenges of genetics as a rapidly changing field of medicine, and she strives to facilitate the integration of genetic medicine into all areas of healthcare in a way that's medically, scientifically, and ethically sound, and also accessible and cost effective to those in the community. Uh, so we, you know, in CART, we have, we invite all the leaders in our field to come and give talks once a month, and only a few of them do we select to give a community talk, and it's really the folks who are doing work that, you know, we think really directly impacts the community, um, and Dr. Chung's work is definitely, um, definitely fits that criteria, and so we're really excited to invite her um, today uh, to give this talk, so thanks very much. Thanks, Shafali. I am really, really glad to be here this evening um, because this is what keeps me grounded, um, is being able to talk to folks in terms of what we're doing and to also hear feedback from you guys in terms of what other things we should or could be doing that we haven't thought of. So uh, I hope we'll have some time for questions at the end, or I'll make sure we'll have time for questions at the end and would love to hear your feedback. So this community uh, knows all of this, so I know that this is a bit of bringing uh, coals to Newcastle, uh, but I really want to emphasize that when I think the community has tried to do research in autism, one of the difficulties, the challenges, has been how heterogeneous it is, that really, you know, there's a very wide spectrum, and I would just emphasize the dimensions are multiple in terms of thinking about this. Um, it's everything from, for instance, age. So if you think about it, there are different challenges when you're two years old than when you're 22 years old. There are just different things that happen in the life course. Um, there are differences in gender um, in terms of how both people perceive differences in gender and as we'll talk about a little bit in terms of the frequency of autism or at least the diagnosis of autism by gender. Um, in addition, there are differences in terms of just cognitive capability or day-to-day -day functioning level. And we put everything under the umbrella of autism, but we have individuals, for instance, who are nonverbal. Many of them, I would argue, are actually quite insightful and very intelligent, but they simply don't speak in the way that you and I speak. Um, to individuals who are really, I think, just extraordinarily gifted. Um, they may have things that they do that are a little bit different, but I would argue that they see the world in a different way, and that insight is incredibly powerful in terms of being able to approach problems in a unique and creative way with new opportunities and new insights, and being able to do that is really, really, I think, incredibly important in terms of building a rich community for us. So with that, though, there are challenges also when we think about some of the other comorbidities. So as an example, certain people have issues in terms of anxiety. Um, those are things that on a day-to-day -day basis can really hold them back. Uh, other folks have difficulties in terms of having epilepsy or seizures, for instance, something very sort of concrete and oftentimes medically quite scary, uh, but that can be one of those other challenges. And others have different issues. Others, for instance, may have been born with a certain type of uh, difference in terms of 
the way their body was built. They may have a hole in their heart. They may have some other um, sort of congenital difference in terms of structural issues. But with all of these, it just makes it difficult in the sense that we lump everyone together and we call it autism, but really, and, and again, I know you guys know this, it's whether you want to call it the autisms, whether you want to see if you've seen one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. We have multiple ways of saying the same thing, but really it's a completely, it's an umbrella term that we use for this. The challenge is that we, when we try and understand this, so from a scientific point of view, when we try and do a deep dive and understand how the brain is different, how it's working, how to be able to support individuals like this, we can't reproduce many times what it is that we're finding. So it's as if, for instance, you have a bag of 500 different marbles, you pluck out five of them randomly, and you do an experiment on them, and then you pick out a five different marbles the next time, and you expect to get the same exact result. But yet you've got different colors of marbles, even different shapes within that, and it's not surprising in many ways that we don't reproduce our findings, that they're not robust, they're not reliable, they're not reproducible, because really we're studying a bunch of different things all at one time. And so with that, it's been hard for us, I think, to make a lot of, make progress as quickly as we needed to, or as I would have liked us to, because of that. We're just not, people then start, you know, sort of arguing with each other, you know, well, you did this, and you know, this wasn't reproducible because your method wasn't right, or you didn't actually control for this. And in reality, the fundamental problem is that we've just studied different individuals as we've done this. So we've been trying to think, again, one of the one joys, I, one of the many joys I have, but one of my greatest joys is um, to be able to be a resource for the autism community at Safari. I love being able to be able to catalyze and make life easier for people to actually do research. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about for a long time is this problem in terms of the robustness, the reliability and reproducibility. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've been attacking that. Another point that I want to uh, make that I think many, again, of you all listening have, heard, have thought about is that I would argue that autism, you know, we sort of artificially construct this as a categorical diagnosis. We give someone a label, we put them in a bucket, we say that they have autism, but I would say that it's actually in many ways a continuous difference, right? So that with this, I think, you know, all of us have some of the traits in terms of as we get to them, and let me just go back to this in case, uh, you know, it wasn't totally obvious, the core symptoms, you know, the core things that are common to everyone with autism in terms of thinking about some of the challenges that people can have in terms of social interactions, that social reciprocity, uh, being able to socially engage, you know, the, that's one of those core features that we think of. Um, and then some of the things in terms of a need for sameness, um, a need for consistency, I would argue in some cases and need to know what to expect and anticipate. And sometimes when that doesn't happen can be associated with anxiety. And to a certain extent, restricted interests and repetitive behaviors all sort of wound up together as we think about that. Now, on the other hand, I would urge you to think about, let's just take about the social dimension for a second, right? So when we think about this and we think about all of this, we think about our friends, our family, you know, there's some people that are, they're just social butterflies, right? I mean, they're just, they're, they have, they love to be able to get out there and be with people and talk to people and they're just wonderful in terms of their engagement there are other people that might be a little shy they might be a little bit more reserved more conservative in that and at the extremes sort of as we've talked about this we we have a bright line and we say beyond this line we're going to give you a diagnosis of autism and again i think to me that construct is a little constrained a little bit artificial we need to for certain reasons to be able to put people in buckets and give them labels because we want to be able to help them and support them and we need to have some way of figuring out who needs those supports. But I would argue, you know, neurotypical, I don't know, are any of us really typical? I mean, are any of us really normal as we think about that? We're just different, right? And, and with this, uh, again, we're just trying to define ways that we can help support individuals that may need support in certain dimensions. So one of the things, um, I, I see patients uh, every Monday, um, and when I see patients, one of the things that families come and ask me all the time is why. I mean, it's this very cosmic question. So when they have a child with autism, if they themselves have autism, 
One of the things they ask is why. And part of the reason, of course, in thinking about why is, is there anything, if we knew the answer to that reason, is there a way that we could use that in terms of supports? Would that help us in terms of thinking about all these many things we could be doing? Where should we focus our attention? Where should we really, really put our energies in terms of doing that? And if we knew the answer to why, maybe we could anticipate what future challenges might be. Maybe we can anticipate what things might be more productive use of our time and our energy and our effort. Maybe some things would be a waste of our time or even potentially would be harmful or detrimental. So by that fundamental question of why and also this sort of subcategorization, lots of people come to me and ask that question. I'll also say, and I think this is, I, maybe I'm wrong, um, but at least in my experience, moms also are asking this for a slightly different reason, I think, which is they have some of them, not all of them, a little sense of guilt. I think they wondered to themselves, at least quietly, was there something that I could have done that caused this? Was there something that I should have, could have, would have done to prevent this? Um, you know, they, they can sort of consciously understand that they, there was nothing they intentionally did, but I still think they get sort of fundamentally bothered by this. They worry about this. So as we've been thinking about this, and again, uh, as community, as we try and put this together, um, there are different reasons for different people. Uh, I think the biggest answer to this question of why is, I don't know. Um, for most people that I'll see clinically, I just don't know. Um, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking to you about what we do know, because we like to celebrate what we do know, what we're learning, and I do think we're learning actually pretty rapidly, uh, but I will say it's quite complex complicated and it's not the same answer for every person. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the genetics and I'll be very clear, uh, part of this is because I'm a geneticist and that's what I know, so I wanna tell you about what I know about, but that doesn't mean everyone's genetic, it doesn't mean the genes are the only thing that matter, but one of the things about the genetics is that in certain cases, we can be very secure, very certain that in fact that was the cause. And by having those anchors, those pillars that we can be very confident of, it allows us to go very deep in terms of the biology and to understand those causes. Again, not to say that that's the only cause, not to say that that's the fundamental sort of uh, end all and be all in terms of this, but it does help us to understand the biology and to decide what to go deep on. In addition to that, though, we know there are many other factors as well, many of which we don't know, but there are data that are emerging in terms of certain things that can happen. And I would argue that in terms of when we think about the time frame that's really critical for this, it's while the brain is still developing, is a critical time to think about. So that could either be prenatally, or in early childhood in terms of thinking about those exposures that can cause differences for the brain. They can be anything from, for instance, environmental exposures, things like pollutants, in certain cases medications that a woman could be exposed to or a baby could expose to, or infections uh, or potentially ways of fighting infections. Again, I think we're still trying to understand exactly which one of those things uh, has an effect and understanding exactly how big that effect is, but there are data su to suggest all of those as etiology. Another one of the things that's, um, I think, somewhat characteristic for autism is that when we think about this, and many of you know, uh, if you have someone in your family or if you're an educator or a therapist, um, is that it's not equal opportunity in terms of genders. And this is true of different conditions that affect the brain. Um, but as many of you know, this is a condition that in general is about four to one males to females. Um, there's slight differences depending on which uh, end of the spectrum you are, just as one metric by IQ. Um, but in general, it is more common common in males than it is in females. And so why is that? You're going to hear me say this over and over again. As my younger son would say, dunno. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, it's one of the things we would like to be able to understand. But again, remember that I don't know that this is an absolute uh, in terms of these buckets. But I would argue the following, um, that we use many of the same metrics to evaluate both boys and girls. So when we have standardized instruments of being able to do the standardized evaluators, we use the same ones for males and females. Many of you have personal experience with this, and I, I will tell you, I have only boys. I have two sons. I wasn't blessed with daughters. Um, and when I look at my boys and look at their behaviors versus you know the girls that are in our neighborhood or in our church or in our classroom, boys are just act differently, right? I mean, my boys threw tantrums. I have to say, still throw tantrums, but anyway, um, you know, they're just very, they're very vocal. They're very outward in this. You can see right through them in terms of being able to see those behaviors. They're very externalizing is one of the expressions we would use, but it's not subtle, right? I mean, they let it all hang out in many ways. 
Many of the females, I would argue, they're much more reserved. They keep it in, in many cases. It's something on the inside. And sometimes, I think it's exactly the same emotions, but it may not be so obvious to us on the outside. They're more internalizing in terms of seeing that. So they may have more symptoms or they may have more feelings that they're not showing, things related to anxiety, things related to sadness in certain cases, but it's harder for us to recognize these things. I'll also say something that may be provocative for some of you who are actually um, professionals in the field. Uh, if you look at the gender of our professionals in the field, look at myself as one of them, we actually are gender biased in terms of our evaluators too, right? So in terms of our teachers, our therapists, our educators, um, we have more women than we do have men. And I would also wonder to myself, is it something in terms of what we as women see as normal as opposed to if you know we, the world were made of males who were doing the evaluations, the educations, the therapies, maybe there are just normal differences between males and females and it's just differences that we're sort of more, we're recognizing more in males because we aren't males ourselves. Um, so whatever, however you want to explain this, there are also I think probably some biological reasons. I do think there are differences in terms of, for instance, some of the genetics. I think that's a teeny tiny part of this. Uh, people have made the argument that Females are more resilient, more resistant in some way, whether it's the biology of some of the steroids in terms of fetal brain development, whether it's some of the genes. There are a lot of theories in terms of this, but like I said, the bottom line, like my son would say, is don't know. So as we go through this, uh, one of the things we put together, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about this, is SPARC, uh, Simon's Foundation Powering Autism Research for Knowledge. And I really want to emphasize, we are really trying to power this for the field, for the community, and we are trying to actually gain knowledge, really concrete things that we can rely on to be able to move forward supports in, uh, for individuals with autism. So as I said, we've started out having lots of different colored marbles, different people uh, that have different symptomatology in this. And what we're trying to do is along multiple different dimensions, get more homogeneous group, more consistent groups, again, across multiple dimensions, whether it's age, whether it's gender, whether it's certain challenges, whether it's genetics, but be able to get more consistency so that when researchers are doing their research, they can be comparing, if you will, apples to apples, oranges to oranges, tangerines to tangerines, um, but then be able to really come to some good scientific conclusions, really robust conclusions about what it is that they're finding. And then hopefully we can move things forward. So as we're doing this, uh, again, one of the dimensions, it is only one of the dimensions though, is about the genetics, because we do know that in certain cases, our estimates, for instance, um, for some very, very smart people who have thought about this, is there, there may be as many as four to 500, even perhaps more different genetic subtypes of autism. And we certainly know, and I can say by you know individuals I was seeing on Monday when I was seeing patients, they do have differences. Different genes, different genetic subtypes definitely have different challenges, things evolve in a different way, um, and they affect the brain in a different way. And so those are abilities, our, our ability to study those individuals, we can actually go very, very deeply in terms of understanding how the brain is working for those individuals. So we put together this, uh, this community. Um, our goal in terms of doing this, we started out actually just a little over two years ago. I'm very proud to say, and I'll come back to the at the end to this, UCLA is one of our star performers in Spark, um, so we're very, very proud to be here in Southern California. Um, our goal that started out just a little over two years ago was eventually to have at least 50,000 families within Spark. Um, and I can go through the numbers and explain to you why, but I won't bother with that right now. But the point to this is, is because it's so heterogeneous that you need to have big numbers. You need to be able to then, if you want to slice it and dice it, if you wanted to have something that was only 1% of individuals with autism, now we have enough because we have at least 50,000 families with this that we can now have enough of any one subtype to really come to some firm, robust conclusions as we, as we think about this. So as we did this, we wanted wanted to, as, as I was thinking about this, we actually did some surveys, some focus groups by listening to individuals in the community. We started there. So we started there asking individuals, for instance, what is it that you want to know? What's on your mind? What are the research gaps? What are the things that we don't know yet that you're curious about um, that you'd like to learn about? So we started with that. 
The next thing we ask them is then, so what would, you, what would we need to do to be able to fill those gaps in our knowledge? And why has it been hard for you to participate in research before? What are all of the practical barriers you know, that you've come across? Um, and how can we really address those to make sure that if you would like to, you can now participate? And so as we did this, as we started thinking about it, it became very obvious. I'm sure all of you can just rattle them off off the top of your head. My life gets in the way, right? I mean, it's busy. I'm busy 24-7, 365 days of the year. I don't have time to be able to do this. Um, I don't have the resources to do this. It's expensive to go to one of these places. They're a long way away. I have to take a day off of work to be able to do this. I don't want my child to be out of school. School's incredibly important in terms of getting their therapies. I don't have time to be able to do that. Um, others were that I'm afraid of some of these things. You know, I don't necessarily want to be on an experimental treatment or taking an experimental medication. Um, so I want to make sure whatever I'm doing is something that's going to be safe. But a lot of people, they didn't say they didn't want to do research because it wasn't important. No, quite to the contrary. Many said, I don't even know about research. I've never heard about this. I don't know what the opportunities are. Um, so they wanted to be able to hear more and they wanted choices. They, they said, eh, it's not necessarily that I'm going to participate in every different type of research opportunity, but I'd like to be able to say this one or that one, if it looks like that would be helpful to me, if it looks like something I believe in, I'd like to be able to have options, have opportunities for doing this. So we built this and I, I put this up as a reference so that if anyone wants to dig deeper in this, this is actually now published and I'll just uh, point out, see if I can use the laser pointer here. Um, so if you actually want to be able to go online, this is actually uh, the URL and this is going to be posted online so you'll be able to go to your web browser and look at that. You can read in detail then exactly why we set up Spark the way we did and lots more detail about this. Um, so as we did this, um, this is set up as an online community. So the first thing we thought about is busy people, busy lives. How can we be able to get them access? This is something you can do entirely online. Uh, if you happen to be here in Southern California, you can do it right here through the UCLA site. So you can come in in person. They'll help you register, be able to walk you through this whole process. But if you feel like you'd like to be able to do it at home in your jammies, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night after the kids are in bed, you can certainly do it that way as well. Um, and as we did this, we wanted to be able to be able, we wanted to have individuals that, again, were different. If we had just everyone that looked the same, that wouldn't solve our problem. We needed to have lots of different individual voices uh, within this. And I think we've managed to do that. So this is now two years into this. Um, I want to give you now an update in terms of what we've been doing. And I think the numbers are pretty exciting. Um, so as we think about this, we now have, I'm proud to say, for individuals with autism, we now have over 34,000 of them. This is in the United States. We have over 34,000 individuals, um, including all of their family members and all their glory, because many moms and dads and brothers and sisters have been kind enough to enroll as well over a hundred thousand individuals. We had a party actually when we hit our hundred thousand mark. Um, and I, I'm really excited about that because it just shows I think the community is actually really committed to this. We want answers. We want to be able to move knowledge forward. Um, as we look at this, uh, or as we uh, see the, some of the characteristics, I want to point out that there is no age restriction in terms of doing this. So we have everyone from the little ones to the octogenarians. So we, we know there are different challenges, for instance, for adults, and even in different phases of being an adult, there are different challenges. There are different challenges when you're in your 20s, than when you're in your 40s, than when you're in your 60s. And so we are now starting to get up some of those numbers um, in areas of that age spectrum where we actually haven't been studying that. Um, for instance, how does, you know, some of us start, maybe we start, our memories start going, I can say mine for one, you know, as we get older. Is it the same for someone with autism? Maybe it's different. Maybe there's some insights we can understand from that. Um, but important to be able to have that full spectrum in terms of that. When we think about, uh, and I'll show you one more slide in a second, um, in terms of individuals who have cognitive issues, intellectual disability, Again, I'll as I said, um, there are multiple dimensions to that, but we do have some individuals, and again, I'll show you in a second, some individuals that have some significant challenges. We also have, I think, some incredibly bright, gifted individuals in the cohort as well. Um, we have, and I won't go into lots of detail, but we've had very standardized measures um, to convince people that this, this 
were individuals who really have autism, and just uh, one of these measures is something called the RBSR. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what we see within other autism cohorts. Um, and we also have individuals who have some gross motor delays. Uh, a large percentage of the cohort does as well. So this is just what I said I was going to show you before. Um, this is along the spectrum, just in one dimension. Uh, but when we look at what the families report to us is their intellectual quotient. Um, and again, that's just one way that we measure it, somewhat artificial. Um, but we see individuals who are at the more severe end of the spectrum in terms of having officially a diagnosis of intellectual disability. Uh, but I also want to show you we have a lot of people, not unexpectedly, about a third of the population that's average. Uh, we also have 21% of the individuals who are actually quite gifted. Um, and like I said, within all of this, I think everyone's special. Um, but within this, we have individuals all along that spectrum. And, and I think we're going to learn different things from different groups of different uh, parts of the community. So I'm going to focus for just a couple minutes now in terms of the genetics. Um, so one of the things that I always do, um, for instance, when I teach the medical students, um, is I say, well, show me the data. Um, where I'm going to tell you a lot about genes. Why should you believe me that genes matter when it comes to autism? Show me the data. So one of the things that uh, is that we do, it's sort of na the nature, natural experiment, um, are twins. Um, so if you think about twins, they come in basically two different flavors. Um, one set are identical twins, um, literally identical because they share the same genes and usually they shared the same womb in terms of as they were being uh, developed. Um, and the other is identical twins, or, for, or rather non-identical twins, or fraternal twins. So these could either be twins that are the same sex or twins that are different sex. Um, but we use this as nature's experiments to look at what genes do. So I want you to think about this for a second. If, in fact, everything was about the genes, then if you had monozygotic or identical twins, then if one twin had whatever it is, the other twin should be the mirror image, basically, and should have exactly the same whatever it is, right? So if we're talking about blue eyes, blonde hair, if we're talking about diabetes, or if we're talking about autism, if it's genes, if it's totally in the genes, this number, this concordance, or that if one has it, the other has it, that number should be 100%, basically, right? I want you to notice that number is not 100%. It's a large number, but it's not 100%, right? Okay, so here's the comparison group. Fraternal twins now, again, sharing the same womb, but their genes are only shared 50%. They have about 50% of the same genes, 50% different genes, just like any brother-sister pair do. And if you look at this difference between the two of them, this is, I would argue, oftentimes shared, in, shared environments, shared exposures in terms of most things, you know, some of us, you know, as parents might dress them up even the same way. They might grow up in the same bedroom, uh, you know, so very much the same pantry that they're seeing in the kitchen. So many similar environmental exposures. But again, the difference here is the genes. And that delta that you see, that difference, is telling you to a certain extent how genetic something is. I won't go into all the fancy calculations, but this is an easy way of thinking about it. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at two different siblings, so two different, again, brother-sister, uh, brother-brother pairs, what's the same here? The genes, on average, are about the same here. They're sharing 50% of the genes with siblings as with fraternal twins, but what's the difference here? That environmental piece that we talked about, right? They're not in the same womb. They're not necessarily growing up synchronously at the same time, so they might be exposed to different infections, different whatever it is in the environment. And again, suggesting to me, overall, when we look at this, that yes, there are genes, and yes, there are non-genetic factors as well that are very important as we think about this. So there's a reason to think about the genes, but there's a reason to think that it's not only the genes as we think about this. So let me uh, give you another analogy. Um, and uh, I will say that when we think about genes, there are genes that come in sort of big, strong, powerful packages, and there are genes that come in little teeny packages. And so we're going to talk about the difference between that because I think it can be quite confusing. It just sounds like writ large, if, you know, when we talk about genes, genes are all the same in this. Um, but in fact, that's not the case. So let me use this analogy that I sometimes use for my medical students. Um, here's a recipe that we've got to make some cookies. Um, so I actually like making chocolate chip cookies. You know, this is a good recipe for making chocolate chip cookies. Uh, but every once in a while, my son will pull a trick on me, and he'll say, uh, we're going to actually substitute something in here. We're going to be creative in the kitchen, and we're going to make a small adjustment to this recipe. So we've actually done this experiment in my kitchen. Uh, we can take the chocolate chip recipe cookie, but instead of putting those chocolate chips in, we can put raisins in. 
And I can tell you, they come out tasting differently. They're still pretty good, but they come out tasting slightly differently as we do this. And so there are some genetic changes that we see that are like this. For instance, some of you have blue hair, or rather blue eyes. You could have blue hair too, but <laughs> some of you have blue eyes. I have brown eyes, and there are certain genetic differences which make our eye color different. Now, on the other hand, we've done this experiment in my home as well. Uh, instead of changing, for instance, just the chocolate chips to raisins, we can actually change the sugar and the salt. So instead of substituting a cup of sugar, we can put a cup of salt in. <laughs> I've got some faces here in the audience that are saying, oh, maybe not the tastiest of cookie recipes. Um, but th it, that's a bigger difference. So my point being is that it has a bigger impact in terms of the taste of those cookies by making that substitution. And that's, in fact, the case that some of the genetic changes that we can change can have a bigger impact, at least in certain, certain parts of the body as we do that. And so they're, they're not all the same. They're not all created the same. So let me just try and make this point in one other way. Um, so if you do this just by size, again, there are certain genetic factors that are relatively powerful. They have a bigger effect. And so those things, in some cases, if you have just one change, it could be one single letter out of three billion, teeny tiny change, but big, big impact, it can have a big, big impact in terms of the brain and the risk of autism. There are other genetic factors which still, on the face of it, are the same one single letter out of three billion. Yet where it is, what it does can have a very different effect. And these types of things can be teeny, teeny, tiny. They can be like a drop in the ocean in terms of the effect that they can have to increase the risk of autism. They do increase the risk of autism. I'm not saying they don't have any effect, but you have to have a whole bunch of these together potentially to get over that threshold that we talked about in terms of being able to say that someone has autism. And what makes the world complicated is that no one has just this, no one has just this. We all have a mix of all of these together. And it's the mix, the tug of war that goes between ones that increase the risk of autism ones that protect against or guard against the risk of autism, all of that together with the environment that ultimately determine these complicated behaviors that we call autism. Okay, so as the community started thinking about this many years ago, and I'll give a lot of credit to Mike Wiggler, who really I think was thinking out of the box about this originally, started thinking about the following situation. And, and this is not true of everyone with autism. So. Um, Listen very carefully in this. Um, so he started thinking about this and he started saying, well, certain individuals with autism, some individuals with autism, they actually don't grow up to have families. They don't grow up to have children. And so when we think about this, if it's genetic for them, how do those genes get passed down from generation to generation? If they're not having children, those genes aren't getting passed down. So where did they come from in the first place? And so he started thinking about this and he started saying, well, are our genomes, are our genes actually stable? Or could they in fact change over time? Could they change from generation to generation? And the answer he thought about, he, he had a hypothesis, he said, well, maybe in fact they do change. You know, some, at some point, genetic changes have to occur, otherwise we all be clones of each other, right? We never would have changed, we never would have had the wonderful diversity that we have. So it has to happen sometime. Maybe some of the individuals with autism, it's because they have a difference. They have one of those genetic changes that was not inherited from their mother or their father, but it started de novo. It started brand new. And so now we've actually done uh, experiments, we meaning geneticists around the world have done experiments where we've taken the genetic information, we've read it out from the mom, we've read it out from the dad, we've read it out from children. And I can tell you that on average for round numbers, there are about 100 places, 100 out of the 3 billion on average that are new and different for any child. Any one of us, my kids, your kids, anyone who has children, about 100 places. Now, of those, approximately one in the genome, a little bit more, but about one of those three billion actually changed the way one of your genes could work. It's within a region that actually makes proteins or makes gene products. The other 99, or at least to the extent that we understand them, probably innocent bystanders not doing much of anything. 
So this now became a very tractable problem. We didn't have to fish through a sea of three billion letters. We could actually look for essentially one genetic change per person and see whether or not that had a meaningful difference. And so when it came time that we could afford to sequence the genome for mom, dad, and a child, and that's only been relatively recently, but when we had the technology to do that, we could now start honing in and identifying what those de novo genetic changes were. And we could look, for instance, if we had one sibling that had autism, another sibling that did not have autism, we could compare those de novo genetic changes between those two brothers or sisters uh, and see which ones were different in the child with autism. And now back of the envelope calculation, although I have to say it's a little more than back of the envelope, on average, we would say that for across that whole spectrum of autism, probably somewhere between 20 and 30% of individuals who have autism have it due with one of those big boxes. A big factor is one of those de novo genetic changes. And what we're now doing is being able to get an inventory of all those genes that are different for those 20 to 30% of individuals to be those anchors, those pillars that we can use to now understand the biology of how the brain works and how it's different for individuals with autism. And then again, start doing those deep, deep dives to understand that. Now, I also want to be clear that not everything in terms of the genetics is due to these de novo or new genetic changes. There can be inherited changes as well. And some of those tiny little squares I talked about, those are mostly inherited genetic changes. Not that it's just one of those that will confer a risk of autism, but again, this package, a bunch of those all together. There can be certain genetic changes, though, where it is one gene. It happens to be two changes in this case in one gene, but they're inherited. In some cases, they come a little bit from mom, a little bit from dad. In some cases, they come a little bit from one of, one of the parents more than the other. But there are inherited as well as de novo changes as well. But the thing that's really exciting, I think, as one of the scientists being able to watch and participate to a certain extent in this, is to see that these are not just random things. So the 100 or so genes that we now feel pretty confident of, they're not just random amongst those 20,000 genes that we know about, but they're starting to actually line up in very particular ways. And as we're doing this, at the end of the day, I don't think we're going to have 500 genetic stories to tell about autism. I'm not sure if it's going to be 20 or 25. It's going to be a much smaller tractable number. Number. And some of the areas that we know are important are that we have connections between brain cells or between neurons. Those connections are synapses, and not surprisingly, that connection, the proteins, the genes that are involved in making those connections work well, being able to relay those signals, are heavily enriched in individuals who have these genetic forms of autism. There's some other things that I won't go too deeply in, but there's some that I think of as being the conductors of the orchestra, being able to make sure the woodwinds are playing with the brass in just the right balance as the brain is developing, and some of these that we call chromatin modifiers or some of those heavily involved, I have to say, not specific to autism, but actually are enriched in autism and also seen in other conditions. So as we started doing this, this is now back to Spark. Um, looking at this, this is a distribution, and again, here's UCLA right here. Um, as we're doing this, you can see that we've got a lot of dots there. We have 25 clinical sites around the country, and UCLA is one of them, but we've got 25 sites around the country. They're working hard to get folks into this, but we also have, you can see there are places where we have no clinical sites, and we still have lots of people that are signing up for this because we wanted to make sure you didn't have to be able to drive to a clinical center, you didn't have to be you know, within a 100-mile radius, you could be anywhere as long as you had a smartphone or a tablet or an internet connection to be able to sign up for this. And so again, as I said, um, we've got lots of uh, families doing this. We have been um, especially looking for those combinations of mom, dad, and the child with autism to help understand these genetic aspects of, as well. Um, and one of the things we did to be able to power this and make it easy is we knew that individuals with autism, getting poked is not a fun thing for many people, but especially for individuals who have sensory issues, uh, having their blood drawn, for instance, is not so fun. And so one of the things we did to make it easier was to be able to collect saliva, just to be able to spit in a cup or use a little sponge on a stick to be able to soak up some saliva from this, make it a lot easier for individuals if they wanted to participate. 
No one has, and let me be clear, you can participate in Spark. You don't have to do anything at all related to the genetics if you don't want to. Um, but if you do, this is an option, and again, we try and make it easy. And so we're now in the process um, of being able to generate a lot of that genetic data I talked about to find some of those genes. We realize that this is important, I think, um, not just for the scientists, but goodness, it could be important for families. And so one of the very founding principles in this was that we're all in this together. We're in learning together, and for us as scientists, as we learn, and that's part of why I'm here tonight to be able to talk to you, is I need to give you updates. We all as scientists need to give you updates with when we feel that we really have learned something, and it takes us a little while. It doesn't happen overnight in terms of this, but we wanted this to be a process where we continue to iterate, we continue to have this cycle of giving back information. So as we did this, one of the things that I felt very strongly as a geneticist about is if we found out the genetic cause of autism for anyone participating in SPARC, you had the option of being able to find out that information for yourself. You didn't have to, not an obligation, but if you wanted to, I felt it was important for families to get that information back. Now, starting this process, we realized everyone was not gonna be able to get an answer to this, because like I told you about, not everyone has a genetic answer in terms of this, and we certainly don't know about all the genetic factors yet. We have a lot to learn in this. But we wanted to have a process so that we actually kept learning. And as we kept learning, we kept giving information back. And that's the found, one of those founding principles that we're, we actually have in Spark. So what's gonna be happening in this is as we generate information, we will get more confidence of some of these new genes that we don't even know about today. We may know about them a year from now, two years from now. But as we learn more about them, we will have more and more results to give back to families and we will keep reanalyzing the information so that we can get that information back. And I will say that we have a wonderful team of medical genetics. We have what we call medical genetics committee that actually has a lot of smart people thinking about it in terms of evaluating this information and this data to be able to say, when are we confident enough and is that reliable information to give back to families? And as soon as we do, we do that all completely free of charge. It doesn't cost any family anything in terms of getting that back. Um, and we even have genetic counselors who can explain it to families in a way that they can understand it. So one of the questions I get sometimes asked is, so what percentage of families are going to get one of those genetic answers? And right now, and we've actually analyzed the first almost 500 families to understand what this number is. Uh, that number is running about 8 or 9 percent, uh, as we're doing now. But I anticipate, just based on the way the field has been growing, that remember we talked about 20 to 30 percent of families probably have one of those de novo genetic changes. I think it's probably going to end up at the end of the day being somewhere around 25, 30 percent in terms of that. But we'll see. Uh, I don't know the answer entirely to this, but those are, those are some of our guesstimates for right now. So some people might say, well, okay, well, well big whoop we do. You know, what does a genetic diagnosis do for me? Um, is that going to change my life? Is that going to uh, change anything? Um, and I would argue for some people it might and some people it might not. Um, and I think it actually depends on many different things. I think it depends on where you are in your life course. I think it depends on what that genetic diagnosis is. I think it depends on what some of your challenges are. And I don't think it's going to be the same answer for everyone, um, just like autism isn't the same for everyone. But I will say that there are some of the reasons that I've taken care of a lot of kiddos. Uh, some of the reasons uh, families will tell me this is, number one, uh, again, it just answers that cosmic question of why, which can be helpful. And in some cases, if people are still searching for a diagnosis, some people get MRIs, they may even get muscle biopsies, they may get all sorts of different diagnostic tests. Um, you can end that diagnostic journey. You can be able to say, we found an answer, and we don't have to keep getting lots of other expensive or invasive tests to do that. I won't say it's the majority of people, but for some people you can imagine that they might be asking, is this going to happen again? Um, so families that have young children especially are oftentimes asking that question. Sometimes it's siblings, sometimes it's cousins of people. Um, and I'm not saying that you know it's a ridiculous question to ask. I'm also saying it's not the most important question for many people to ask, but it is a question some people ask. And this can certainly answer that question. And the important answer for many people is that it's not going to happen again. And I think that just can be relieving for some people and give them sort of the liberty to think about maybe having an additional child in the family. Um, for some people, uh, they just, they're, they're information seekers. They like to be able to plan. They like to be able to anticipate. And having more of a roadmap in terms of what to expect. And more importantly, how can we support someone so that we can avoid some of those 
curves in the road that might be coming up, uh, some of those roadblocks or those barriers um, by either just looking more carefully for things or even intervening before they happen. Um, for some, it's actually just great to finally meet someone else who knows what it's like to have been there and done that exactly like you did. And I can say, we've, I've had the pleasure of running a lot of family meetings for many of these. They're individually rare, um, but for people to actually get together for the very first time and meet someone else who's been through, they feel like they were separated at birth, I have to tell you. Um, they compare pictures to each other on their phones and they're like, oh my gosh, that looks exactly like Sally did when she was two years old. Um, or to be able to say, you know, there's, there's this one particular thing that they do and they realize it's exactly the same, um, but more important to be able to figure out solutions to problems. So some of the most practical things like sleeping at night or something in terms of a particular uh, dietary, something that sort of stimulates some GI discomfort. Um, but there are particular are things that, like I said, it's if you've been there, if you've done that, you just feel like you've got a kindred spirit for someone who understands where you've been and can help you along that journey to where you're going. Uh, and like I said, in terms of this, um, in some cases, I hope we will get to this, um, we'll actually be able to have either specific uh, research opportunities that will get us closer in terms of treatments and trials, uh, but things that are going to help us all along the way. Okay, so wanted to be able to share with you, not just me telling you, but you to have the opportunity to hear it directly for yourself. So this was one of our Carrie's first families in Spark. Seemed pretty typical. But somewhere after her first birthday, we gradually noticed some changes. Carrie. She became fixated on kitchen utensils. And she was obsessed with strings. The doctor told us that she had autism, and he sent us home with not much of any guidance or recommendations for what to do to help her. I had a million and one questions. The first one, we always wonder why. Why us? Why her? Hi, Carrie. Here, let's hang up your coat. I wondered if there was anything that I might have done or not done to cause autism. How are you, sweetie? Questions remained, and they they lasted all the way up until recently when we participated in the Spark study and got the genetic finding. I was shocked when I got the result that Carrie had a genetic change in CHD8. I really wasn't expecting it. It turned out to be such a relief. I no longer thought of Carrie as having autism. I began to think of her as having this genetic difference. And as a result of that, she had the features of autism. And that may sound like not a big deal or a subtle difference, but it's a huge difference. Spark discovered one small change in one of Carrie's genes. This one tiny change had enormous effects. Autism's one, but there's also stomach issues and sleep issues. The finding explains so much of what we struggle to understand. So much of our lives have been dedicated to helping carry. Getting a genetic diagnosis is another step in our journey. I'm looking forward to connecting with other families with the same diagnosis. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. can't imagine a reason not to participate in the SPARK study. There's so much to be learned and nothing at all to lose. Okay, so I'll try and wrap up quickly. Um, but one of the exciting things that I had also mentioned that Spark is trying to do is to enable researchers to be able to do research better, faster, and easier. Um, easier for them, easier for families that want to participate. And so we've got something called the Spark Research Match where individuals that are in Spark get emailed essentially opportunities. Anything that they're eligible for, they get an emailed an invitation. 
under no obligation to participate in anything, but they know about things and then they can be able to decide for themselves whether or not that opportunity sounds like something they'd want to do. Researchers have the opportunity of designing better studies, designing better research questions by answering um, about who the study population is, who should be eligible for their study, asking a very specific question, hopefully, and being able to get more consistent results because they hopefully have designed studies better in terms of doing that. So I'll just give you one example. Um, I first started talking about the genes, but again, thinking about this, genes are not everything. In fact, we knew that there were things that might be relevant to environmental exposures, in particular things that might have happened during the pregnancy. And so a team of, at the uh, Johns Hopkins University actually started thinking about a questionnaire to ask the mothers that went over during pregnancy, what are some of the things that uh, happened during their pregnancy? And uh, really remarkable to me, um, they put this out in terms of the community, and I think the response from the community was fantastic. Uh, of those individuals who were invited to participate, within literally a few weeks, 60% of people that were invited agreed to do this, and they finished their study so quickly, we ended up uh, ending the study within, as I said, just a few weeks. Um, as we did this, one of the things that we insist, uh, this is not an optional thing, but any of the researchers that use the SPARC cohort, uh, their requirement is that they have to actually tell the community what they found. Um, and as we do this, we make it very much our business to make sure that this is accessible in a way that's easy to understand and approach and archive so that someone can come back to it whenever. Um, and so we've created things like this, infographics, which I would love to have some feedback, um, but in particular try and summarize what it is that we're finding. I won't say this is the end of the study, there are, the researchers are still actually learning more from this, uh, but we want to be able to give updates as quickly as we can to the community so that we can continue learning together and so that you can continue to help us think about what are the next big questions that we need to, to focus on. The other thing we do is we get feedback literally at the end of the survey from families because we want to know what we did right and we want to know what we did wrong. Uh, we want to be able to understand if this was something meaningful to them. And this to me is um, a good sign uh, because when we ask them, for instance, how important was this research topic or participating in the study, I would say that we actually got a pretty strong endorsement that this was important research to be doing and that they uh, actually did think it was a good experience being in that study. And so we try and make those numbers, continue to make sure we're doing meaningful research for families. Um, just to say that was one study, but in fact uh, we have many, many other studies that are either now in progress or they're coming down the pike. Um, some of them are intervention studies, so specifically um, medications that might be useful. And again, not everyone has to do this, um, but these are things that are available. These are a little bit more of a, a sort of lift, uh, heavy lift in terms of doing them because they do require going to a clinical site. They involve a medication. There are others that don't involve medication but do involve going to a site, and there are some that you can just do from, like I said, your jammies at home at 11 o'clock at night. Um, so there are many, the point being is that there are many of opportunities um, to be able to fit whatever you might do. So as we think about this, I'm a very goal-oriented person. I like to have a target that we're trying to achieve, um, and really what my target is is to be able to make everyday life better to be able to make it easier. Life is just tough. Um, so make it easier, uh, make it more meaningful, being able to get more joyous days rather than uh, down days as we're doing this. And anything that can do that to me is a win. Um, and as we think about this, I wanna be very clear, there's not one dimension where the answer is gonna come from. It's not gonna be a pill for many people, um, it, but it may be, specific ways in terms of specific educational strategies. Um, I personally am very excited that I think there are lots of ways that new technology is gonna support all of us. Um, and as we do this, uh, we just need to be able to figure out for any one person what the right combination of these is going to be. So let me just wrap up by saying uh, that as we do this, um, I hope we've got opportunities to work together in doing this and make this go faster uh, because I'm impatient as well. I would like to be able to get to these uh, goals in terms of having better supports for individuals in my lifetime. Um, and I've got a big birthday coming up and so I would like to be able to make sure that we move this forward even faster. Um, so as we do this, uh, again, just wanna say very special thanks, especially to all of the participants who are incredible in the Spark community. Um, these are the uh, individual families who've contributed and also the individual research teams. And just very specifically, these are our beautiful uh, Southern California Spark leaders uh, here. And then in addition to the group at UCLA, uh, also we've got back at Spark Central a whole team of dedicated people.
So I'll be glad to stop here and take questions. So there are some index cards that folks have. If you've uh, thought of anything, write your questions down now. We'll pass them up to the front, and um, we'll be glad to go through questions. It's not on the curve, real quick. So we did the swab a year ago. There was like a, a community event here in the middle of Tokyo. Um, so if we haven't heard anything on genetic results, it's just because nothing's been matched yet. Yeah. So um, I'm going to repeat the question just so folks that are online can hear. So the question was that about a year ago, uh, you were a member of Spark, which is fantastic, and you contributed a swab, and you haven't heard from us yet, and you're thinking, where is that, you know, what, what's going on there? Um, so the answer is, is that, as you can imagine, with so many people, this is a very big enterprise. We actually, as we do the genetic analysis, we batch these things. We do whole groups together, and so it's not like it's sort of you come in and the next day your sample goes and gets sequenced and everything else. Um, so we are in the process of being able to have, I'm hopeful that the first big batch of sequences are going to be coming out this summer. It still means that the group has to analyze them, um, but the important thing is that if you haven't heard from us, which many people haven't, um, it's not because there isn't going to be an answer ever. Uh, it may be coming back in the future. And I will say that for th folks that have some urgent need for an answer, uh, do talk to your providers for urgent answers. There are ways of getting some of the same testing that we're doing through Spark, but getting it through your doctor if you need it real fast. Thank you. Okay, there's a, oh, here's the microphone. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'll filter these a little bit and ask them to you. Okay, so this is actually a question that I think I'm sure you get asked a lot, asked a lot um, which is about IVF. Oh. And one of the questions, this one specifically about is there a way to actually do um, post-fertilization testing of the embryo um, yep. for those genes? Right. So um, in vitro fertilization, I think many people know, but it's when you uh, make the baby outside of the body and then put that embryo back into the womb. Um, so the question becomes, if there were some genetic factor that you knew to screen for, it would be possible, theoretically, to screen the embryo for that genetic factor, and that's true for any hereditary or genetic condition. Um, in many cases, there's actually, uh, as I was talking about before, when these, let me be clear, when these genetic factors are de novo, so they were not inherited from the mother or the father, I didn't say this, but the chance that that's going to happen again is incredibly small. It's empirically about 1%. It's not really zero, but it's very, very low. And so in many cases, families don't have to go through in vitro fertilization or what we call pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So before the embryo is put in the womb, we don't have to do that genetic testing because it's unlikely that it's going to happen again. Let me also be very clear that this is not something that uh, in many cases for many individuals with autism, I wouldn't see any reason to do any sort of genetic selection against something like that. I think there are many wonderful people that... Um, I think are incredible people who happen to have autism in terms of a behavioral trait, but I don't think this is something that um, people would want to do necessarily genetic screening for. Again, my point being is that there's a wide range in terms of the spectrum, um, so this is not, not about eugenics. Absolutely. Um, so another question that I'll kind of broaden a little bit is actually around the question of clinical genetic testing for autism. So SPARC is a great opportunity um, but what, you know, if a child has an autism diagnosis and would like to get ge clinical genetic testing, yeah. how is that typically done and what are the oh, very good questions for the family? Very good question. Um, so in terms of being able, and this is especially true in terms of being able to get answers in real time, relatively uh, faster at least than Spark does as a research study, um, genetic testing is oftentimes covered by insurance. Um, it is something that many of the medical teams that do this, and this could be neurologists or autism centers or geneticists in terms of doing this, they may um, ensure that the cost is going to be covered by your insurance. And they may go through pre-authorization because it can be expensive otherwise, um, but many of the laboratories, and I'm going to use some very technical words, but in case you wanted to ask your provider about this, they may do what's called a chromosome microarray, they may do fragile X testing, they may do an exome sequence, they may do a genome sequence, they may do some combination of those, uh, but all of those can be done for sure from a blood sample, and some laboratories can even do them from a saliva sample, as we do in Spark as well. 
Um, as those are done, they are best done, at least the exome and the genome sequencing, in my opinion, are best done when they include the individual with autism as well as both parents, um, because then we can recognize very readily those de novo genetic changes. Uh, and the time it takes to get results, depending on which one of those tests I talked about, can be anywhere from usually about four weeks to something like three or four months. So it does take a while. It doesn't come back as soon as your blood count does. Um, but it is something that certainly is faster than the research that we have going on through Spark. Um, so I'm going to ask about two or three more, and then people can ask later on as well. Or at home and or and Dr. Chen's doing another talk for us tomorrow morning. We're doing hard at work. Um, so Adam, this is a great question. Um, is it possible to modify effective genes? Ah. So are there gene therapies? Yes. Um, so some things that you've probably been hearing about, maybe even seen on 60 Minutes or other things, um, is this revolutionary new technology called CRISPR. Um, so there are ways of being able to do gene additions or gene therapy as well as gene editing, uh, CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9. Um, these are things that at this point are still, we, we use in the laboratory all the time. Um, so we do this in terms of being able to make um, cells different or being able to study particular processes. But right now, we rarely, if ever, do them in people. Um, so there are some gene therapy trials um, that are actually being done in, bizarrely enough, eye diseases, one of the things you might not have thought about. Um, and there is actually the first FDA-approved gene therapy for particularly an eye disease. Um, to my knowledge, maybe I don't know everything, but to my knowledge, there are no gene therapy or gene editing studies yet, or even clinical trials yet for autism specifically. Um, but these are things that are being improved um, to be able to be able to support individuals again. Um, it's going to take a while. So as this comes, as this technology matures, uh, it has been a quantum leap forward in terms of the advancements that have been made, I would argue, in the last three or four years. But it's still going to take quite a while until we can do it safely. And that's very important is that whatever we do is safe um, and before we can do it effectively for conditions like autism. But, but there are new opportunities. So back to nature of fertilization, uh, because I think this is probably a question you also get asked a lot, um, which is, is there a correlation between IVF and autism? Ah. So, um, this is a complicated, it's a very good question, uh, but it's a very complicated answer. So um, the reason I say that is because many couples that go through in vitro fertilization don't do it just for the fun of it. Um, they do it because there was a very specific problem they had conceiving. Um, so infertility issues sometimes associated with being older couples or having other things going on. And so it's hard sometimes to be able to disarticulate and know what some of those factors are that might have been associated with autism rather than the in vitro fertilization itself per se. Um, it's also difficult because at least in the United States in vitro fertilization is not the same in all laboratories and all different programs. Um, there are different, believe it or not, media that are used in terms of growing the embryos. And there are various, this hasn't been tracked well or studied well in the United States. And so there may be some of those variables that could conceivably be associated with different genetic changes. We know of certain types of changes in genes that are so-called imprinted genes that are definitely associated with an increased risk with in vitro fertilization. We do know that there are certain types of birth defects that we see more frequently with in vitro fertilization. So it's conceivable that those in some way could be related. But I think at the, at the end of the day, for couples who are having fertility problems that don't have other options, the benefits still far outweigh the risks in general in terms of making that decision to go forward with IVF. Could you say something about the relationship between autism and schizophrenia? Oh. Um, so schizophrenia is another condition that affects the brain and affects behavior. Um, it's certainly different in the sense of when we usually see symptoms is usually more in later adolescence, young adults. Um, and there are some similarities in some dimensions, but a whole lot of differences in things as well. Um, schizophrenia, we are just beginning to understand in terms of some of the differences. It's, it's similar to autism. We have a long way to go, I think, in terms of that. But we are starting to see that for some individuals, genetics is a factor. Um, may be different genes than what we see in autism, but may be related to some of the same fundamental brain processes, at least. Um, and there may be different times of vulnerability in terms of the brain. Um, 
there may be earlier vulnerabilities with autism and there may be earlier and later vulnerabilities with schizophrenia. But both of them, I would say, uh, have similar challenges in that they're not all the same and it's really, uh, I would say, we're in our infancy with both of our, our understanding for both of the conditions. I'm gonna do one last one because it's late, so thank you for staying a little over. Um, so there's a lot of interest um, recently with studies that have shown sort of optimal outcomes or individuals who might fall off the spectrum at some okay. point. Um, and so someone was actually wondering if you could talk about what your thoughts are on folks who might leave the spectrum at some point. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, as we talked about it, someone might cross over that line uh, and be able to uh, lose their diagnosis of autism. Um, I think, you know, one of the things is that early diagnosis, I'm a firm believer that the earlier we can catch this, the earlier we can recognize it, I should say, um, the more opportunity we have in terms of affecting especially early brain development. And so to the extent that um, when you're born, it's not the way your brain is gonna be at the end of the day. There's a very dynamic process that's going on in early childhood to development, and I think we have more opportunity to be able to mold that if we can act earlier. So every child, obviously, we want to be able to mold to be a wonderful person, uh, but when we do start recognizing some of those differences, I do, I'm a firm believer that when we recognize them earlier and start some of those interventions earlier, it helps the brain get on the right track. And I do think that some of the things that we see are secondary in terms of after you may have some difficulties, you're compensating in some way to make up for those difficulties and if we don't have to compensate in the first place we may be able to get you on on a better track to start out earlier so there are folks that are thinking a lot about that and trying to do this really on scale um, everything from helping general pediatricians to help families recognize this um, public awareness campaigns to be able to make sure families can recognize this earlier um, and to be able to help support individuals and and I do think that there are lots of opportunities I, I think there are ways of being able to even if someone has challenges, to compensate for some of those challenges, to be able to get over the things that may be most bothersome, um, even if they don't end up crossing over that line, even if they still retain that diagnosis. Great. So I think we'll stop there because we're over and you've given us a lot to think about. So thank you very much again for coming. Thank you.